Well, good afternoon. Uh, before we start, I, it's not lost on any of us that today is the 19th anniversary of 9-11, and uh, we have firefighters that are in Idaho and in other states, uh, but today is always a good day to remember those that serve uh, in the public safety area and in our armed forces, and that uh, as we uh, work through uh, issues of state government, it's always good to remember the people that have sacrificed and have given us the opportunity to have what we have in this great country. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We're going to announce some very good news for both Idaho students and families. Supporting K-12 public education in Idaho is our constitutional and our moral responsibility, and it's my top priority as governor. My goal is to make Idaho a place where our children choose to stay and for those that left to choose to return. We simply cannot meet that goal without a strong public education system in place to help all children, all students, become lifelong learners and eventual participants in our state workforce. The stresses on our kids, families, and educators right now are enormous. The global pandemic has put a spotlight on schools and their critical importance to families, students, communities, our economy, and our entire state. I'm happy to announce today that I'm directing even more funds to support K-12 education in Idaho. While other parts of Idaho state government have scaled back spending in response to the reduced budget, We've been working closely with a variety of stakeholders and school leaders over the summer to make sure students and classrooms are shielded from significant budget reductions. In addition to the unprecedented $122 million we already put towards schools this year, today I'm announcing that we will direct an additional $99 million in relief funds to public schools, completely restoring budgets that school districts had set for this academic year. Over the summer, I worked closely with the Trump administration and our congressional delegation, emphasizing the need to support public schools. The U.S. Treasury just updated guidance last week, I believe it was Friday evening, giving states more authority to use federal corona relief funds for COVID-related needs and public school budgets. And we did not hesitate to seize the opportunity to support our schools. This makes Idaho one of the only states in the country that has significantly increased funds for education during the pandemic by the tune of 10.5%. How are we able to do that? Through our responsible handling of the pandemic, through conservative management of our state budget, and the will of Idaho businesses to step up and inspire consumer confidence and employee confidence to safely engage in the economy and support our economic rebound. Our support for schools and families does not end there. I'm also glad to announce that we're making $50 million available to Idaho families as part of our new Strong Families, Strong Students initiative. When school districts across the state abruptly closed schools last spring, our workforce took a hit. Families continue to face many challenges as they rapidly adapt to changing circumstances in their children's education. Many Idaho parents have had to quit their jobs or reduce hours, and many incurred personal expenses to cover the basic education needs of their children. When parents have to step in to provide instruction and equipment dual due to school-related closures, we see them pushed out of the workforce, something that strains our economic rebound. The new Strong Families, Strong Students Initiative helps ensure parents are less likely to exit the workforce or expend hard-earned household resources in order for their children to receive the education they deserve. We will offer parents $1,500 per eligible student and a maximum of $3,500 per family. The Strong Family Strong Student Funds will be 
made available to eligible Idaho families in October and we will be sure to announce when they can start applying. The State Board of Education will administer the initiative and finalize the eligibility criteria in the coming weeks. I will ask the State Board to be cognizant of those children who are in the achievement gap and implement this new initiative to minimize that gap. Another priority for the State Board over the summer has to, help, has to do with helping families bridge the digital divide. For devices and connectivity, the Strong Families, Strong Students initiative will help this important effort. I've asked my Coronavirus Financial Advisory Committee to finalize each of these proposals at their next meeting. The one and only reason we're able to make these investments in education during the pandemic and provide for such direct support for Idaho families and businesses is because of our responsible approach to governing. Idaho was just recognized for leading all 50 states in our economic momentum. We are the envy of other states that faced anywhere from a 20 to 40 percent uh, budget cuts in all areas, including education. In Idaho, our state budget is sound. We're the most fiscally solvent state because of conservative revenue forecasting, because we've set aside healthy reserves, we've limited government spending, and we've rolled back state regulations. In Idaho, most schools are open for in-person instruction. We've increased financial support for K-12 education by nearly 11%. And we've made enormous investments in safe, the safe reopening of schools. I want to express my profound thanks to Idaho parents, school leaders, our dedicated educators, the business community, and each and every individual for helping to position Idaho to rebound successfully, successfully from these very challenging times in our history. With that, State Board of Education President Debbie Critchfield and Superintendent of Public Instruction Sherry Abari will, ha will, Abar will have a few remarks and then we'll take your questions. Debbie? Good afternoon, Governor. I want to thank you for the invitation to participate in today in the significant announcements um, that have been made. Uh, back in March when schools went into soft closure and um, we all took a deep breath as we considered uh, the, the outlook for the education budgets, um, districts were very responsive as uh, strategic and proactive decisions were made relative to line items to lessen the impact for them individually and um, to lessen the strain on fine, uh, state revenues. Uh, we saw um, a variety of responses to that. There was a lot of news and, and media attention to those budget reductions and something that I want to call out that didn't receive a lot of attention at the time was the response of our um, administrators, our superintendents, and our local boards. They essentially put their heads down, they got to work, and they decided they wanted to figure out how they could get school back into session come fall time. And, and we're seeing that the, the fruits of their labor as uh, we start school. And I'm, I'm proud and, and pleased of the reaction, the, uh, the contributions that our administrators, our educators, and everyone has made is uh, they have considered the overall and the big picture that we have here. And so today, is, as we are uh, excited to announce and, and understand the, the good implications and the positive um, outcomes that can happen with the restoration of the funds, this truly is a wonderful day. And um, I'm hopeful that our boards will be as deliberate and um, considerate in their thoughts with the restoration of the funds as they have been with the reduction of their funds. That they're, they're careful and, and they understand the environment and the landscape that they're working in and, and this can um, contribute to their overall efforts. Uh, a couple of comments and thoughts relative uh, to uh, the governor's announcement with the, the micro grants. For several months we've all uh, listened to as um, conversations have taken place on how to best utilize the stimulus funds that have come from business to industry to healthcare and of course to education. And I believe that today brings us full circle in providing those critical supports for critical parts of our state and that is certainly centered on the family. 
as uh, parents and grandparents and, and guardians are considering the best ways to support their students, this is an opportunity for them to make specific decisions relative to technology in their own homes. We know that um, technology is something that we're all very dependent upon and, and looking for ways. As the governor pointed out, the uh, digital divide committee that have been working have uh, revealed many things and have um, identified gaps in places that, that we weren't previously aware, aware of that we're trying to make improvements. I believe that the grant has uh, three primary functions. One will be for our um, school districts. It will alleviate, alleviate the stress that they have right now as they seek uh, to find um, technology um, wherever they can uh, to satisfy the needs that their students have. In ordinary times, this is a challenging effort. In extraordinary times, it can be overwhelming. And so I believe that that will help uh, with those efforts. Um, number two, this is a benefit for our teachers in the classroom. Whether the classroom is in person in a school or whether it's online and virtual, teachers are putting together lessons and instructions and, and have material that they need to have delivered to the student. And this will um, help emphasize um, the, the need to have technology in our homes and, and to make that available uh, for students and their academic uh, achievement. And then uh, thirdly, I believe that uh, for families, this is a way to encourage and to emphasize the engagement that, that parents have right now. Um, there's been a lot of bending and adapting and, and changing as the circumstances have changed, but uh, we are um, hopeful that with this opportunity that parents will, will see where their needs are best where it comes to technology and um, they'll be able to make the, the decisions that make sense for them according to their local needs and their local school districts. Uh, yesterday I had attended an event um, in my community with the local Chamber of Commerce and um, the, the director at the end of the meeting uh, made a statement that I want to co-opt a little bit, but um, at the conclusion she said it's a great day to do business in Minicasia. And with the announcements that we've had today, I would um, conclude by saying it's a great day for education in Idaho. So with that, thank you. Well, good afternoon out there to everybody. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank my fellow constitutional officer, uh, Governor Little, uh, for continuing to make public education a priority uh, throughout our state. It's no secret that this has been a real challenging time for our schools, for our parents, for our students, and our educators. Um, and this money will support the schools uh, throughout the state. And again, I just a heartfelt thank you uh, for making sure as we go into this school year uh, that folks understand the governor has made uh, education a top priority. We hear every day about the new challenges uh, that districts face on the fly. You know that as a mom and as a parent, uh, even in the best of times, that things come up uh, that you're not ready for. And even as uh, districts headed back, uh, to school, some of those things included how do we social distance? Uh, where is the PPE going to come from? And so uh, the great news is everybody can use this money to address uh, their unique needs. Um, and so it's important for students and parents and school staff to feel supported uh, throughout this process. It's been tough enough, uh, but again, it just feels like an exciting day, uh, turning a, a corner, um, and moving into the school year uh, with a governor who really has had his eye uh, on education. So uh, as your superintendent of public instruction, uh, a, a huge thank you out to him. And we will be holding a webinar to those educators that are listening next week to help them uh, with this um, money that will be distributed out. But again, uh, heartfelt thanks. Um, it couldn't have come at a better time. Thank you. You can see I've got great partners in this endeavor. Okay, questions? Betsy. Wait. The aid program to the families, how will that work? $1,500 per student, maximum of $3,500 per family. Is this just for families with students currently in public schools? Yes. And is 
is that enough to make the kind of difference you want to make what, about the large families that we have in Idaho? Well, we hope so. Uh, it's, uh, we think it'll cover somewhere over 30,000 students, 14, 15,000 families. So uh, we, we hope so. Hi, Melissa, wherever you are, there you are. Melissa, go ahead. You're up. Push, send. This is the beta test model. What's that? Oh, you have to unmute her? Bear with us. This is a new beta test model. Well, in the meantime, as we try and unmute Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Oh, there you are. Hi, Governor Little. There you are. Hi there. Uh, you know, to tack on to Betsy's question. Melissa, go ahead. Yeah, I, um, to tack on to Betsy's question, yeah. I'm talking. I'm unmuted. I hear you. Um, to tack on to Betsy's question, there are about a quarter of a million public school students in Idaho. Um, I, I'm curious as to... Oh, you have to unmute her? You are unmuted. Keep going, you're doing fine. This is a new... Is there a delay? That's why we need more money for the digital divide. Well, in the meantime, as we try and unmute... Melissa, Melissa. Well, there you are. Hi, Governor Little. Hi there. Uh, you know, to tack on there. to Betsy's question. Melissa, go ahead. Yeah, I um, to tack on to Betsy's question. I'm talking. I'm unmuted. I hear you over and over. Um, to tack on to Betsy's question, there are about a quarter of a million public school students in Idaho. Um, I. I think I got the crux of it. Uh, we'll continue to work on it, but there's a whole bunch of students that are in school now. We got over half our counties have an incident rate of less than uh, 10 cases per 100,000, which for all intensive purposes is uh, fully into the green. So uh, the, these are for students that, uh, for parents and for students are in areas where uh, we've had problems. Uh, we. Obviously, we don't have enough resources uh, to send that uh, out to all the parents, but we're trying to we're trying to address and and the state board will uh, and the department will continue to uh, uh, refine this program. But we're, we want to make it available for the parents that are uh, most in need and having to make the most sacrifices. So uh, but there's there's lots of students. I've been to 20 schools in the last month. And, and there's a lot of schools that are uh, uh, fully open. Uh, there's a lot of them that uh, almost all their students are in attendance, so uh, they don't, uh, they don't, uh, wouldn't qualify. We'll keep perfecting our system. Um, just a quick clarification. So the the students who are eligible are only those who are distance learning from home, not those who are attending in-person classes in Idaho's public well, schools. Well, obviously, that that's where that, that's where we put the most resources. The 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 department will uh, uh, and and uh, uh, Debbie can come up and and knock the rough edges of what we're saying. But we're trying to address the the people that are most aggrieved, the people that are having the biggest problem. And in fact, it doesn't start till October. Uh, hopefully some of the uh, problems that some of the school districts have and are going to get better as their connectivity goes up as some of the rest of it. Go ahead, Debbie. The intent is to open the program for any student in Idaho, whether they are a virtual student or a private school student, public school student. Um, there will be a, a needs-based uh, uh, component which hasn't been determined yet 
But the goal is to open it very broadly so that um, families who um, have internet needs or uh, perhaps have um, had to hire a, a tutor or to supplement the needs and to secure internet, um, it'll be a, a list, a small list of um, what's, um, oh, I'm missing the word, uh, what's available uh, for, or the usage, the, the available usage. But the goal is to have it open widely for all students in Idaho. Is there a follow-up on that? So I believe the governor said something about 30,000 students. Is, this is a fairly small percentage of all students statewide, correct? Right. With the, with the dollars um, that, that the program will be able to receive, uh, the, the hope is to, again, start with needs-based and then have it phased in according um, to a, a level of income. And so um, we'll, we'll see how far the money goes. We wish that there were more, but we believe that this is a, a really substantial start into helping some of our um, most um, vulnerable families who maybe have not had reliable access to internet, have not been able to, to purchase that, who their school districts, because of resources, haven't been able to provide them with a device that the child can keep at home, that this will help offset what the districts aren't able to do and, and complement um, what parents have been able to do at their own home. Does that help? Governor. Hi, Governor. When you announced the $99 million in cuts in the spring, you were very prescriptive about where those cuts were going to take place, uh, starting with teacher salaries and delaying the career letter. With this $99 million, does that reverse all of those cuts dollar to dollar, or do, do the do these dollars go to school districts and charters for them to figure out how to spend it? What's the mechanics of how this name? Well, the mechanics are we still have to comply with Treasury guidance. It has to be COVID related. Uh, so, uh, uh, and, and that's, you know, we will be, uh, we have to be uh, cognizant of, of the strings that are on these dollars. Uh, so, uh, obviously, new programs, it wouldn't be, it's something that's been impacted by the uh, by COVID, but there'll be flexibility as it goes out to the districts uh, to try and do the right thing. We're just trying to, as all the programs we put together, whether it was the grants that we gave to businesses, uh, at that point in time, we're trying to plug holes that existed in the uh, PPP program. We're trying to address the negative consequences of the COVID virus, which is the intent of Congress when they passed the CARES Act. So just to clarify and to follow up then, the money has to go towards a COVID-related loss or COVID-related expense in education. It has to be spent this year as well. Yes, right? that's correct. So you can't really loop back into teacher pay with this money necessarily, uh, unless no. you can draw a nexus. Well, it'll be, uh, uh, you know, there's some of the some of the adjustments. So we'll we'll have to look at that as we go forward. We want that money to go out. But we're, as I said, we're trying to to uh, minimize the impact of, of not only the reduction we had, because we, our reduction, uh, the reduction we did was a result of, of uh, uh, COVID, uh, as, you, as you're well aware. And of course, we work with all the stakeholders to try and uh, give them as much certainty as they could in their budgeting going forward. Uh, this Treasury guidance is kind of a gift to us. Uh, we uh, didn't anticipate it, even though uh, I, I continue to ask Treasury and Congress to, to give us that leeway. So we're trying to eliminate that, but some of it will go in. One of the, one of the big needs that I'm hearing from districts is uh, teacher shortages. Uh, teachers that haven't shown up, uh, the necessity to have extra teachers. Uh, that I'm, I'm, uh, from what I hear from administrators and principals, that's a big problem. Once again, just a quick follow-up, Governor. So as I understand, the Treasury guidance says that up to $500 per public school student per state is presumed to be COVID-related, regardless right. of what you spend it on. So given that, the $99 million that you're putting back into backfilling the school budget cuts, will it fill, backfill all the programs that were cut, including the cuts to the teacher career ladder and other um, and other initiatives. 
Well, as, as we all know, uh, salary-based apportionment uh, is, is the state sends the institution so much money per uh, uh, professional slot, and then the school districts have a lot of leeway about how, how they use that. So that leeway would still be, uh, would still be out there. Uh, as, as you well know, uh, most of the uh, districts have already got their, uh, their contracts done, so uh, they'll have to sit down and roll up their sleeves and figure out how best to, because we're trying to minimize the impact on students. And if that's, uh, you know, being competitive on teacher pay, if it's for more, uh, I anticipate a lot of it will be for additional help because what I hear from teachers is they've got the normal demands in their classroom and then some of them where they're rotating back and forth, they've got all these demands because of the technology that's out there. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll rely on the school districts to do the right thing to deliver education to those kids. Go ahead. I would just add to that that those cuts were in line items, um, not in the career ladder. And so uh, moving forward, we asked for the career ladder um, to be unfrozen in my budget. So for this uh, coming legislative session, uh, so I just wanted to clarify that. Um, I guess you could consider that a, a cut, but it, the cuts that the governor is referring to are the ones that were made to like the line item professional development, um, technology, and so back to Kevin's question, um, they have to be COVID related. So if you had a, you know, if you still have uh, professional development needs, you could use this money for professional development needs if it's COVID related. If you still had technology needs, even though that was cut and it's COVID related, you could still use that money for technology needs. And we asked for that in the budget moving forward to be unfrozen. Yeah. Um, so, um, yes. No, not in the current year. Not, not with this money that the governor's talking about right now. But moving forward in the budget ask, we have asked for that to be unfrozen. I know you asked for the governor, but I'll, I'll step in. So I, I think we're taking two separate issues and, and meshing them in, in together in a way that they don't belong. So um, when the 2% holdback in the spring and the 5% projected holdback for this year were um, put together, as the superintendents pointed out, those were for specific line items. That's what this restoration is about, is to restore the money that was taken out of the line items. But the dollars for the career ladder are, are separate. Whether or not there's a um, motivation and um, a will, um, however, that the, the timing of that will have to take place at a different time. The career ladder dollars and, and that discussion are separate than what we're talking about with the restoration of the holdback. Has that made it worse or, or better for you? <laughs> it, it's, it's two separate things. So the, 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 the holdback and the reduction that did not take in the career ladder, that's a separate thing. So the restoration of the, the money of the dollars today are specific to those line items um, that, that totaled the over $90 million between the 2% and the 5%. Does that sound still confused because in, in reductions that were laid out in the spring included the phrasing of the career ladder? If you go back and you um, total the, the line items, the individual, um, the professional development, the technology, um, the leadership bonuses, I'm trying to think of what the other, what were the other ones? What am I missing? Professional development, thank you, and IT. There, there's a list, and so it's from the operational, the monies that the, the districts got for their operational monies. That is separate than, than monies that were um, going to the, the career ladder. It was 90, what was it, 90, anyway, in the 90s was what that totaled, 98? 98. There you go, 
And I'm sure someone in here can get you a list of, of exactly what those reductions were. Governor, I have a question for you from James Dawson from Boise State Public Radio. He's up on he's up on Zoom, but we'll avoid the audio issues for a minute. You said you're hoping to get this money out to families in October. Is that quickly enough to help students since the fall semester would be halfway done and students might be back in the classroom already in many parts of the state? Well, it, it, a lot of these programs, uh, we didn't know this was available until last Wednesday. And, and as, as you can tell by the line of questions that it's a, uh, uh, it, you know, we're, we're gonna have to uh, continue the, first off, we gotta get CFAC to make the recommendation. Second off, the state board's gotta work on it. Uh, had Treasury given us guidance a month and a half ago, we'd have been able to do it earlier, but as we've seen all along in this pandemic, uh, uh, the rules are uh, one way, uh, one day and another way later. Uh, we're delighted to have this opportunity to uh, put this money into K-12, but I know there's people that are spending money today to help their kids at home, and they're going to have to wait a little bit, and I'm sorry about that, but that's just the way the rules are. Betsy. Tuesday? Their next scheduled meeting. I believe that before this proposal, Idaho still had $350 million left unallocated in its $1.25 billion share of the CARES Act funds. So this is going to take, this $150 million will take a little less than half of what's remaining. What do you have your eye on for the rest? Well, uh, what, what, what did you say was left, Betsy? It was $350 before this. Yeah, that's... that's, that's uh, of course, we put some money into the unemployment fund, which is what most states or some of them have put it in there. We put the 200 in when we did to not trigger a tax increase. Uh, that's and as we go through this unemployment, uh, there may be that may be an avenue, but we got between now and the end of the year uh, to do it. But we, you know, we have unexpected things coming up, and it's just like had we put it all into the unemployment fund and then Treasury came out with the new guidance, we wouldn't have been able to do this. So uh, we'll continue uh, to take uh, requests from uh, CFAC. We finished our rebound committee yesterday. Uh, I thank the committee members because that was a group, a statewide group of both educators and business people, community leaders who were making recommendations. Uh, but we will continue to look at the needs. Uh, you know, we, did, we put some money into behavioral health uh, you know, we, we continue to look at areas where we think it complies with the intent of the CARES Act to uh, address uh, COVID-related problems. So, but, and at the end of the day, uh, if, if unemployment doesn't go down, uh, we'll probably sweep more of it into the unemployment fund. Without Scott Logan here, there's going to be a short press conference. Now, Kevin, you can take his place. Nobody can take Scott Logan's place, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll ask you a question that goes in a, a slightly different education direction. You've taken pains to restore funding for K-12. What about higher education? Was there any availability was that an option was that something you could do is that uh... I, I don't think it was an option but you got to remember higher education got 45 million 49 million dollars uh and of course we're still aggregating or you are or i am somebody is a state board is matt is we're still aggregating uh the costs at higher education uh we've got some of the institutions where their enrollment's up uh, but they've had a lot of costs but that 49 million dollars uh, which went directly to higher education uh, should ameliorate 
uh, some of the costs. But it, it, I mean, everybody's suffering from this thing. There's no, I, I, I would love to make everybody whole, uh, but th that's just not going to happen. It's just uh, uh, the, the most important thing we can do is restore the economy, get people back to work, uh, get uh, kids back in schools. If I can do those, maintain healthcare capacity, get people back to work, get kids back in school, a lot of these problems will be uh, a lot less. All right. Anything else? Have you got anything, McKinsey? All right. Thank you all. And, and, and uh, Sherry and Debbie, thank you very much for your assistance. Uh, you got a little work to do, so thank you. <laughs>